I hope you're ready for more fancy slide transitions because you are about to experience another virtual lecture on quantitative statistical methods. Today we'll be learning about variables and factor analysis. Please remember you can rewind or pause at any time. First we'll discuss the different types of variables and scales we can use to capture data. Then we'll discuss the issue of misspecification, including what it means to have a formative or reflective construct in indicators. And finally, we'll introduce factor analysis and do a brief demonstration of an exploratory factor analysis in PASW. Here we go! There are three main types of variables, each of which we'll discuss in more detail in subsequent slides. The first type of variable is called nominal. Nominal variables are categorical and have no intrinsic ranking. There are also special kinds of nominal variables called dummy variables. These dummies are mutually exclusive categories and have values represented by either a 1 or a 0, indicating presence or absence of the categorical condition. The second type of variable is called ordinal. Ordinal variables do have some intrinsic ranking and are often captured using Likert scales. And just to confuse you, the third type of variable is called scale. Scale variables include continuous values that can be meaningfully compared. For example, income. Each of these variables will now be given a little bit more attention. Nominal variables are often categories, such as religion. These categories have no real intrinsic comparison. For example, if we were to represent each religion with a number, we would not say that those with the higher numbers are more religious. That just doesn't make any sense. Same with race. A Hispanic individual has no more or less race than an Asian. Thus, we can't make meaningful intrinsic comparisons between these categories. Similarly, nominal variables include unmathable numbers, such as zip codes, phone numbers and regions. We would never say that someone living in California with a zip code like 92065 has more or greater zip code value than someone from Ohio with a zip code of 44117. It just wouldn't make sense. It's not meaningful. Even though numerically 44117 is less than 92065. Make sense? In addition to having a funny name, Dummy variables are a special kind of nominal variable. They are mutually exclusive and are represented as either presence or absence of a value. So, for example, if my variable is male, then a 1 would indicate that the respondent is male. A 0 would indicate that the respondent is not male, and thus is female. Since we can assume that those who are not male are female, because these two categories are mutually exclusive, we only need to include a variable called male. Including a variable called female would be redundant. If the variable includes multiple levels beyond two categories, then we need to include variables for, for all but one of those categories. The next slide elaborates a little bit on this point. So we've given a survey to the Simpson family. One of the questions asked about religion. Starting from the bottom, Maggie is Hindu, Lisa is Buddhist, Bart is Jewish, Marge is Christian, and Homer... What's Homer? Because Homer is not one of the other four religions, he is by default other. Thus, we don't need to include this last category in our data set. Dummy variables are a slightly more complex concept. If they don't make perfect sense right now, don't worry about it. We'll discuss them in a little bit more detail in future lectures. For now, we just wanted to expose you to the concept. Ordinal variables capture data using a spectrum of values, usually ordered from low to high. These values are often spaced at even intervals. For example, pretty bad is one value higher than gag me. These variables also have some intrinsic value. So someone responding with tasty is indicating that they feel the food at the DM residency is more delicious than someone who responds with edible. Thus, the values on the spectrum are meaningful levels of the concept about which we desire data.
Lastly, and easiest to understand, are scale variables. These variables are continuous and usually unbound, and have intrinsically meaningful zero point. So, for example, we have age. Age can range from zero to about 110. Income, on the other hand, can be either positive or negative and has no real bounds. Notice in the case of income, zero is also a meaningful value, though perhaps not as desirable as in golf. So here's an example. Diet can be represented as a reflective construct. As a reflective construct, it may include measures such as I eat healthy food, I do not eat, eat much junk food, and I have a balanced diet. Notice how each of these measures seems to be saying the same thing. We would expect them to be highly correlated, and removing one wouldn't really change the nature of the thing we are asking about. But then consider the formative construct, health. Health can consist of some conceptually distinct components. For example, if I am healthy, I may have a balanced diet, I may exercise regularly, and I may get sufficient sleep each night. But notice how each of these measures is actually asking about something that is conceptually different. Just because I exercise doesn't mean I have a balanced diet. And just because I get good sleep doesn't mean I exercise. This is unlike the reflective measures for diet. If I eat healthy, then I probably don't eat much junk food. If I have a balanced diet, then I'm probably eating pretty healthy. Also notice that if I remove one of the measures for health, it changes the nature of the thing I am asking about. For example, if I only include F1 and F2, this is a different picture of health than if I include F3 as well. Thus, together, formative measures form the latent construct, whereas reflective measures are simply a reflection of the latent construct. Well, that about does it for the different types of variables. The next concept we'd like to discuss is the nature of variables, and how observed variables relate to each other and to their latent constructs. Just as a review, in these models we have the latent construct on the left represented by an oval. This latent construct is also sometimes called the latent variable, the unobserved variable, or the factor. The rectangular variables in these models also have many names, including items, indicators, measures, or observed variables. Each of these measures corresponds with a specific question or data collection item used during the data collection process. Lastly, the small ovals represent measurement error. Now, there are two different kinds of latent constructs. One is reflective and the other is formative. For reflective constructs, the direction of causality is from construct to measures, and the group of measures should be correlated and interchangeable, so that if one measure is dropped, the nature of the latent construct does not change. For formative constructs, however, the direction of causality is from the measures to the construct, and the measures don't necessarily correlate, nor are they interchangeable so that if one is dropped, it does change the nature of the latent construct. This is another advanced topic that you don't necessarily need to master just yet. We will spend more time on this topic in multiple future lectures. However, we do want you to understand this issue enough to be aware of it in your own quantitative research, because incorrectly specifying constructs as reflective when they really ought to be formative, or formative when they really ought to be reflective, leads to misspecification, which can lead to erroneous statistical results or may prevent a researcher from being able to find a good fitting model. Jarvis et al. found that in the most recent articles published in the top marketing journals as of 2003, 4% had misspecified models. You may say, well, 4% isn't that much but consider the impact a single study can have on a field. If one of those misspecified models is a highly regarded and cited research paper, others have built their work on the findings of this seminal piece of work, and others have built their work on the works that built on that seminal piece, and so on. Thus, misspecification can lead to misguiding future work. 
A related issue is how we conceptualize our constructs. Let's say we want to get a better understanding of innovation. If we aren't careful about how we define and conceptualize this construct, basing it on what others have, have written, what makes sense, and what the construct's specific position is in our context, then we won't know exactly how to formulate measures to capture that construct. These poor measures may include many things that are not actually relevant to the construct we have, have hypothesized about. We may end up incorrectly specifying the constructs as formative or as reflective if we don't have a firm grasp on what it is we want to measure. This leads to the issues already discussed, as well as to an unreliable, invalid, and generally useless bit of research. Spend a little more time in the beginning solidifying your constructs, and you'll save a lot of time and trouble in the long run. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of the shoe, the horse was lost. For want of the horse, the rider was lost. For want of the rider, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a nail. Enough said. Well, enough about that. In our lectures up to this point, we have discussed theory, constructs, and data collection. Next semester, you'll learn about data cleaning and confirmatory factor analysis. Today, we get to talk about exploratory factor analysis, usually abbreviated as EFA. In the family tree of SEM, EFA deals with the measurement of the overall model. And in the case of the EFA, we are exploring what the model might look like. I'm just going to summarize briefly the information listed on this slide so you may want to pause to take it all in. Factor analysis is a method for identifying an underlying structure or relationship among the observed variables in your model. Factor analysis enables the grouping of highly correlated sets of observed variables into factors. These factors are what we will measure as the latent variables or constructs. To illustrate how the EFA works, we'll look again at healthy living. In this example, these six measures all ask about healthy living. What the EFA does for us is help us determine if there is a better way to construct latent factors to represent the measures. So, we could have a single factor or latent construct made up of all these measures, or we could say that two of these measures are actually capturing information about diet and the other four are capturing information about energy. Thus, we could have two latent factors or constructs being captured by these six measures. However, we may also say that two of these measures are capturing information about diet, two about rest, and the other two about exercise. An EFA helps us determine the appropriate number of latent factors that we can use to represent our observed data and guides our naming of those factors. Well, time for a little demonstration. For your exercise, please do an EFA for the productivity and quality items from the Sohana items dataset found on Blackboard. Work through the EFA to find a decent solution, then email me the final pattern matrix. Once again, using the Sohana items, do an EFA with burnout and answer these questions. For this homework assignment, no intro or conclusion is really necessary because we're not really making any causal assumptions or developing any real theory. We're just exploring the measurement model. Good luck!